Hi, I'm Gregory Shillette, and I really appreciate being asked to do this keynote for Arts and Society Conference. I only wish I could be there in Galway, having been there for a long time. But we'll make do with the technology we have at hand. And I am pre-recording this in mid-June 2020 from New York City. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Just in the past few weeks, we've all been sort of startled to watch as racially insensitive public monuments, which is to say monuments directly or indirectly supporting white supremacy, have been demonumentalized. It's a process being carried out by municipal officials in some instances, but a substantial portion of these memorial takedowns have involved acts of graffiti, toppling over, dismemberment, beheading, and monuments being tossed in the rivers by groups of people who are protesting the death of George Floyd and other black citizens murdered by predominantly white police officers in the United States. At the time of this presentation, there have been over 50 public monuments removed or slated to be removed in the US. And most, though not all, are related to the memory of pro-slavery US Confederacy. About a third of these were physically targeted by protesters. And let me add to that in the UK and in Europe, including Belgium specifically, another two dozen effigies have already met or will soon suffer a, a similar demise. I believe there was one in New Zealand as well. What I wanna do in this presentation is look at this recent wave of monument takedown. Uh, let's call it the They Must Fall movement after the Cecil Rhodes, they, He Must Fall movement in South Africa and uh, talk about the way this is both something new, it seems to be tearing a hole in our expectations and our, and our ideas of what we are uh, as, as nations, and at the same time, it is something that's repeating a pattern. This talk is about basically three things. One is to discuss in a little bit of depth the question of monument removal or monument takedowns, not just as they're happening now, but as they have happened over the course of the last few decades and even longer, uh, on and off in a pattern and clearly a pattern that has now emerged in a much more forceful way. Secondly, I wanna talk about possible alternatives, ways that people could mark their own history in a more complex, and diverse way in public spaces. And third, I want to talk about, talk about something I call the unpresent. And that is to say, a present in which we seem to be repeating a notion of the now as opposed to being able to think either about the future or the very concept of futurity that might be different than the present, that might be better than the present. And we're also incapable of thinking about the way the past could be a kind of ruin that disturbs the present now. That's what makes these current monument takedowns so interesting because while they are in a way a removal of the past, at the same time, they really are a struggle with difficult memories that challenge our very notion of the present and I think actually point towards the possibilities of a different future. But let me go through a little bit of a slideshow to talk about some of this work democratizing our collective past, using memories that disturb the present. It's just a pastiche of some of the demonumentalizations that have been taking place over the last week or so. Among the people, the very illustrious former figures who have fallen include Robert Lee, Cecil Rhodes, King Leopold II of Belgians, and Christopher Columbus. You see him here without his head. Even Thomas Jefferson was toppled off of his throne like perch by protesters in Portland, Oregon. And in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson ordered a statue of Winston Churchill covered up with sheet metal in order to protect it from gra graffiti that proclaimed the British bulldog and voice of wartime England was a racist. 
And this is former Mayor Frank Rizzo, also former police commissioner. I want to stop here a second because he was the police commissioner when I was a very uh, young person, really in the 1969, 1970. And along with a, a gang of other sort of delinquents at the junior high school, we created an underground newspaper using mimeograph machine. You might remember some of you, those very odiferous ways of reproducing text. Uh, we stuffed these underground papers in students' mailboxes in their, in their lockers. Uh, we got in trouble, of course. But in this newsletter, we denounced then police commissioner Frank Rizzo for his racism, his treatment of the black community. And it has taken all these years, over 40 years for his statue to finally be seen or be attacked by um, people. And it will be actually removed from Philadelphia, which is good news indeed. But it's important to realize these acts of demonumentalization have their own precedence. And we can go back to 1971, when a group of six indigenous people, part of the American Indian movement, tossed blood-colored red paint on the statue to Teddy Roosevelt outside the Museum of Natural History here in New York City in order to protest the way Native people are depicted in the sculpture, but also his own history of racism and manifest destiny. 46 years later, in 2017, another group called the Monumental Removal Brigade carried out an identical action. And they released a statement saying, this is not an act of vandalism. It is a work of public art and an act of applied art criticism. We have no intent to damage a mere statue. The true damage lies with patriarchy, white supremacy, and settler colonialism embodied by the statue. And that's a statement by Monument Removal Brigade. Just this past week, a group of indigenous people who called themselves American Indian Movement, which in fact is uh, a current recapitulation of the group that carried this action out and other actions, AIM, just this last week, they pulled a statue of Christopher Columbus to the ground in Minnesota. And remember, that's the same state where George Floyd was murdered. What I'm trying to point to here is a certain kind of repetition that takes place within resistance and opposition to white patriarchy, to certain kinds of class imagery in public spaces. Let me just expand this phenomena a little bit and uh, point to the fact that a few days ago, this was June 14th, a Congolese born man entered the Musée de Quai Branly, the Jacques Chirac in Paris, and in a soft voice, but firmly denounced centuries of pillaging by colonial powers operating in Africa. Uh, he walked over to a 19th century African funerary object and finally with assistance from four other activists, he pulled it free of its mounting. I'm just gonna show you a clip of what happened. Some of you may have already seen this. Let's just see, here we go. Ozala Diabanza and his associates, a team of a few, I think it was five people, entered the museum. And as they pulled this free, he stated that. The names at the entrance of this museum are the names of colonizers who pillaged the art that is now here. These items were pillaged between 1880 and 1960 under colonialism, he pointed out. And according to Kate Brown and Artnet News, during the filming of the museum, Diabanza noted that he paid 12 euro to enter the museum and then said, we did the calculation to see how much money our artworks generated for this museum. And the profits generated by the museum are in the billions, he said. Today, we are recuperating what is ours. Uh, the newspaper Le Monde reported that, quote, the culprits of the foiled heist, because ultimately they were stopped 
claim they were going to, not going to keep the artifact for personal gain, but were instead trying to return it to Africa. So clearly we can all agree that under certain circumstances, the past is fully capable of disturbing the present. Now that is to say a certain archive of historic hopes and traumas, we might also say tropes and failures, when they materialize and they visualize, these will disrupt our very notion of current social identity. And we are experiencing that right now, that's quite clear. Um, why is this moment so unusual? And yet I wanna make the argument that it's also simultaneously part of a repeating pattern of resistance that goes back many decades, if not far longer. How does that repetition and that sense of breaking away connect together? How is that paradox sort of possible? But let me first discuss a couple of ways and a couple of specific projects that might offer alternative means for representing what we could call, what we could call the counter historical narrative of our history or our histories and doing so in a, in a kind of uh, specific public space. In 1992, here in New York City, 500 years after Christopher Columbus came to the so-called new world and 25 years before the current crisis of historical representation we're now going through, a group of over 30 metal street signs with images on one side and texts on the other appeared in downtown Manhattan. Uh, they marked the forgotten or altogether unknown histories of working men and women and children, African Americans, Native peoples, Latinx people, Asian Americans, among many other marginalized groups and forgotten events. Uh, the project was created by a group called Repo History, uh, a multi-ethnic organization of artists, educators, and activists whose mission was to, quote, retrieve and relocate absent historical narratives at specific locations in New York City. One of the things we were trying to do was to sort of amend the way history is presented in public. Uh, this is actually not one of our projects. This is just an example of the way history is remembered. Uh, some of you who are art historians might know Stark Davis was an important artist, particularly in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And this is a plaque put up by the people who live in the building that he once had his studio in around 13th Street around Union Square here in New York City. And it says that on the site, the American artist Stuart Davis maintained the studio and so on and so forth, that he was interested in jazz music. What it doesn't say is that he was actually a theorist, a very important theorist for the American Communist Party, the, early, the Communist Party USA and its, and its cultural win. And so these kind of omissions from history were, was one of the things that repo history wanted very much to sort of target and challenge. We did take our name from this underground film. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. In fact, I'd say this is your homework for tomorrow is to watch Repo Men. The idea was that we would not be like the Repo Men and Repo Women in some cases who take back property that working class people can't afford. We would be the Repo Men and Repo Women of histories that have been lost or forgotten in public spaces and act to put those histories back in public view. For example, from the 1992 project, this piece that actually documents where the first slave market was, it was called the Slave and Yield Market, when the Dutch were the colonizers of Manhattan. And this location is actually precisely on Wall Street. It's only a short distance from where the stock market started. The stock market did have for many years and does have a plaque on the ground, a bronze plaque. Uh, there was no marker for this particular location of the slave market until just about a year and a half or two years ago when the current mayor, Bill de Blasio, allowed that to take place. What was quite interesting was in news conferences, the people who put the plaque up recently said that it had never been marked before. And I had to sort of get online and send some letters saying, wait a minute, in 1992, for the period of just one year, this group Repo History did in fact mark that site. As you can see, 
even repo history has become a lost and forgotten history, a lost archive, if you will. Other sides included this piece to early union organizer here in New York City. This piece that actually talked about the fact that a equestrian bronze monument to King George III was pulled down during the Revolutionary War here. And the lead and the other materials that were made up the uh, statue, I assume it was bronze, were actually melted down and turned into 42,088 bullets that were used during the war against the British. This piece is by one of the members of the group, Jane Pagnuco, whose great aunt, Rose, came to the New World from Italy, went to Ellis Island, which most people consider to be the gateway to America, to the United States. Unfortunately, she was not considered fit for whatever reason. And she actually died in custody on Ellis Island and was then buried in a pauper's grave on Hart Island. Just in the past few months, people who are indigent and have no money who died were also buried in pauper's graves. And this one uh, is actually the same location we're looking at here. Here, this is Hart Island, which is off the Bronx in New York City. And of course, in this case, people were dying from COVID-19 and put in these kind of mass graves. This man's name, June, his parents gave the artist who created this sign, Art of Repo History, they gave him an image of their son because he had died of exposure to the winter and they wanted people to see him. They also wanted to have a memorial to him. So Repo History also marked these very small, you might say, histories, which to us meant a great deal, were really large, these everyday tragedies and stories someone named June. But we also tried to create histories that really tied back to the present, that really tried to disturb the present. This is actually part of a three-part sign, which makes a connection between the great Negro plot, so-called, of 1741, and present-day revolts, rumors of revolts, in the Bronx and other parts of New York City, where people of color lived and where policing was very intense. This is in 1992, don't forget this project. Uh, and so things haven't changed very much at all. But in 1741, a group of uh, African American, in some cases, African slaves were rounded up, 100 or so people and executed or exiled out of Manhattan. And it was all because there was a number of buildings that were burned down at the time. The British population thought it was an uprising, a slave uprising. Probably was just a kind of hysteria. But again, past histories interfering, disturbing, intervening in the present. Or this piece, which was not about history really so much at all, but about the present, even though this image was meant to refer to the great crash of 1929, the stock market crash. But on the back of this sign by Jim Costanzo, there's a detailed text talking about the emergence of what we now call neoliberalism, that is ultra free market politics. Something that was beginning to really be noticed intensely in the early 90s, although it had been around, of course, for at least a decade, if not longer. On the back of the sign, there was a description of these kind of policies, but the location of the sign is quite important. We had permission for one year to put it up in front of the New York Stock Exchange, which happened to be having its own 200th anniversary. You can see from the blue flags that they were flying outside, 1792, 1992. And the Stock Exchange people were very upset this was outside. They called the Department of Transportation who had given us our permission to put these signs up. And the DOT people said, no, I'm sorry, once we give a permit, things stay in place. And the sign did stay up for a year. Mainstream newspapers and communication systems, which was really important to us, to get the word out 
to the mass public, not to just make it a park project. In 1994, we worked with the storefront for art and architecture and alternative space in Lower Manhattan to create another project, uh, this time just nine signs, talking about uh, gay, lesbian, and trans history, LGBTQI history uh, in that part of New York City, including this sign about the transgender activist, Marsha Johnson, whose body was actually found uh, in the river, in the Hudson River, not far from this location. The police claimed that she committed suicide. Others believe it was gay bashing. The note I want to make is that when the group Repo History went to take down the sign in, after the year was up, and this is in 1994, probably the end of 94, early 95, trans people who were working as prostitutes and sex workers, and also working as activists with runaway youth and others in that area uh, said, no, you can't take the sign down. That belongs to us. And so it was left behind for a period of time, who knows how long, until gentrification swept over this part of Manhattan. And now, of course, with the High Line Park nearby, it's become extremely expensive and fancy. And uh, the trans community is no longer present, you know, visibly present, at least not that trans community. A few years later, we decided to do a third street sign project in New York City that came to fruition in 1998, although initially with some trouble from the city, which I'll get into. The project was called Civil Disturbances, Battles for Justice in New York City, and it sought to address the ways lawyers and other activists had used the law to extend rights to people who are either politically or economically disenfranchised. So for example, we talked about the lawsuit that Brenda Berkman brought against the New York Fire Department, the uh, official New York Fire Department, because she wanted to become a firefighter and they tried to stop her. And eventually she did win, although it was a very, very difficult process, one in which she was treated very badly. And this sign went up out, not very close to the fire department that she worked in in Lower Manhattan. Another project by one of our members talked about the fact that she herself had been <clears throat> part of a lawsuit that was basically uh, desegregating schools in New York City. When we tend to think of the Jim Crow policies being in the South and, but even in the North, there was a flavor of it with schools being separated between blacks, people of color and white people. So this sign went up in the street. And as we do with every project, we created a map that people could use to locate the signs, do their own walking tour. But one of the things that happened with this project, just before we were ready to put it up in the street, we got a fax from the city, from the Department of Transportation saying, we did not have permission to install the signs even though we've gone through all the same processes we had done for the previous two exhibitions, street exhibitions that we did. That may be because of a sign like this. Now this is 1998, it's a sign by Jenny Pollock and David Thorne. And as you can see, it says from 1994 to 96, 75 people were killed, shot in back, shot in the head, pinned face down and shot, choked, hogtied and crushed, beaten to death, etc. by New York City police officers. Only three officers were convicted of committing any crimes and zero for murder. Nicholas Hayward, whose son you see a graffiti mur mural to or memorial to in his front seat. Uh, Nicholas Hayward, who just died this last year, in fact, an African-American activist, <clears throat> lost his son when a police officer shot him. His son had a plastic gun and uh, he was killed in a housing project in Brooklyn. Mr. Hayward put a copy of the sign in the window of his car uh, while we were still fighting the city to get the project approved. We also put one upside, outside of Anthony Baez's home, 
Again, another graffiti mural to him, not, not something we created, but the sign went up outside. That's Mrs. Baez in the window. Anthony was playing touch football, American football in the street. The football bounced off of a car, turned out to be a off-duty cop who got out, put him in a chokehold, and uh, killed the young man. Just so you know, the backs of the signs had these texts. We realized sometimes that the text was a little too long. We adjusted it in later projects, and we put the signs up ourselves. Sometimes we were stopped by the police. When we showed the permits that we had, the police said, okay, and walked away. And again, every sign project had its map. This is from the first project in 1992. All the dots show all the locations of the signs, which included, of course, the previous ones I showed you <clears throat> about the slave market about the potter's field and so forth. There was some controversy, some of the projects, including this project. But all in all, projects went on until the year 2000 when we basically repo history came to an end. Several years later, Daniel Tucker, former student of mine and now a gentleman who runs a program, a professor who runs a program at Moore College in Philadelphia about social practice. Walking through Brooklyn with his camera or a cell phone, <clears throat> he snapped this picture. Mr. Hayward apparently had kept the sign intact or as intact as he could for many years in that housing project where his son was killed. I don't know if it still exists. But Reap History is not the only group of activists and artists who've tried to reclaim history, especially alternative histories, in public streets. Let me show you a few other projects that relate to this kind of work. In 2008, Howling Mob Society was created in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and created a series of very accurate or realistic looking historical markers that were in fact guerrilla action by Sean Schiffler and other artists, and placed them in the street illegally in Pittsburgh. And they talked about the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, which led to a general strike at the time <clears throat> in Pennsylvania and other areas and it was quite an uh, impressive and important moment in labor history. There were many signs that they put up around the city and ultimately they looked so realistic that no one took them down uh, or it took a very long time for anyone to remove them. Howling mob is what the newspapers called the strikers at the time, many of whom would have been Irish American. This is an image of Black Panther Party in Oakland, California, with a group of school kids. And in the early 2000s, the collective Center for Tactical Magic, which is only really one person named Aaron Gatch, we'll call it a collective, worked collaboratively with former Black Panther member David Hilliard and the British artist Jeremy Deller to install the sign you see on the right side on this ordinary looking traffic light. Why? Because at this intersection of Market and 55th Streets, and it's a very plain looking location, it would seem very ordinary. It's a location where the Panthers took the first public form of community action in Oakland. This was in 67, and a group of students were crossing the street were injured. And these were mostly African American children who had to cross that street to go to a school on the other side from the black community. The Black Panther Party convinced the city of Oakland after many attempts at protests uh, to actually put this traffic light up. But what it took after all was uh, not the normal process of submitting requests <clears throat> because the city council, which was mostly white, refused to take action or they would postpone action. It actually took the Black Panthers going into the street in their full regalia and stopping traffic and letting the children cross the street safely. And then suddenly the white commissioner and the white uh, city council decided to put the traffic light in. So Center for Tactical Magic marked that location. And here you see a couple of other. And what's of course interesting about a lot of these projects is you, would, you could almost walk past them if you weren't paying attention to the city architecture and things that were going on around you because they're disguised to look like official signage.
This is called Earth's Eye, and it was created by Alan Michelson, who is also of Mohawk descent, Mohawk tribe being uh, a group of indigenous people here in New York. <clears throat> and he's marking the site of what was called Collect Pond down near City Hall, Lower Manhattan, which is a place where early settlers used to all kinds of things, ultimately became highly polluted and covered over by the paving stones. Uh, these are probably not the original paving stones, but he remarked this location. And Alan, in fact, worked also with repo history on some of his pro on some of our projects as well. And I wanted to show you this, and I'll just do a. This is a piece by Krzysztof Wojcicki, the Polish American artist, uh, taking a monument to Abraham Lincoln in Manhattan and projecting on it the words and images of people who had been in the Iraq War pro and con, different voices. And I'm gonna show you a clip of that in just a second. So in the teenage kids, all, you know, you just blowing, you know, blowing hot air and stuff like that. So we got into a very intense argument. He's like, well then why would you tell me? I would think that you would understand why. In 2009, African-American artist Dred Scott donned a sign with the phrase, I am not a man printed on it, replicating the iconic message, uh, messaging placards that were carried by striking black Memphis sanitation workers in 1968. But of course, substituting or changing, excuse me, inserting the word not in I am a man. More recently in 2019, Dred Scott recreated an overlooked, almost forgotten slave rebellion that took place in Louisiana in 1811. Here are some images of that. And just this morning, Galway-based curator Megs Morley pointed out to me that after the Irish Revolution and during the early part of the 20th century, crowds would pull down monuments celebrating British colonial rule. rule but they would then reuse the pedestals or plinths to the new nation's own pantheon of heroes and heroines. Interesting kind of reuse of historical memory, I think, in that case. In 2011, Megs Morley also curated the Tolka Arts Festival in Galway, and she invited me and my uh, colleagues, Olga Kaparkina and Matt Greco, to present imaginary archive at Gallery 126. And in that project, which is essentially an archive of documents about a past whose future never arrived, created by various artists uh, who I, and I've traveled this exhibition to different countries. So I have works in it from New Zealand, from Ukraine, and from Germany, other parts of the world. But in this case, Irish artists who have themselves been very interested in the way history is represented, contributed, and that includes people like Brian Hand, Annie Phillips, Ben Gihogan, Neil Moore, and many others. And you can actually look up Imaginary Archive and find their work online. Third part of this presentation, I want to talk a little about what the nature of the moment is we are living through now and how these various relationships to the past played themselves out or are playing themselves out. Because no one would deny that the past 10 to 12 years has been a time of extraordinary, even delirious social, cultural, and political uh, events, most of them near catastrophic in nature. Nevertheless, things, continuously and seemingly spontaneously return to a state of normality, though only if we agree to define normal as the eternal return of consumer capitalism and its state of spectacular recapitulated emergency, emergency after emergency after emergency. For isn't it so that after each new shock, each new catastrophe, floods, terrorist explosions, 
police or military riots against unarmed citizens. We embrace in a bewildered state often the all to eerie tranquility of collective consumerism, or what the late Mark Fisher called capitalist realism for short. In other words, the normalization of success of crisis, but also the aestheticization of crisis through a process of doubling and repetition could only be described as a state of an uncanny reality, or what I will call here the unpresent. The unpresent habitually reappropriates acts of resistance and counter-normalization, such as the demonumentalization we've been talking about, as if confronting a dangerous hole torn into its totalizing consumer reality. Typically, this gap is quickly plugged back up again by being transformed into a familiar, let's actually say over-familiar public choreography of dissent. As Walter Benjamin lamented many years ago in the 1930s, that the catastrophe is that we find ourselves in a state in which things just go on. Particularly distressing about our experience of the unpresent is the profound absence of any expectation that the future might be fundamentally different, let alone superior to the now. Indeed, so alienated is our very notion of the future today, of futurity itself, that it seems we can only anticipate tomorrow as a flat out doubling of what we already know. In short, we have been evicted from the future unless it is a simply an interchangeable concept of tomorrow that, that, that appears to be just like the present, a rhythmic pulsing of disaster and monotony over and over again. In other words, crisis as normality. Indeed, so alienated is our very notion of the future today, of futurity itself, that it seems we can only anticipate tomorrow as a flat out doubling or redoubling of what we already know. In short, we have been evicted from the future, unless we simply think of it as something completely interchangeable with the present, a rhythmic pulsing of the disaster and monotony again and again, crisis after crisis. Of course, to be fair, we do find some forceful, if still thankfully marginalized voices forecasting a divergent tomorrow. Disturbingly, many of these self-proclaimed prophets either veer into the dystopian imaginary of accelerationist social collapse, or alternatively dream of resurrecting a Euro, Caucasian, and typically Christian empire that never existed, which points to something else missing within the experience of the unpresent. Fictitious kingdoms of whiteness aside, there are no ruins to be found in an Orange County present at least none that actively disturb the flattened landscape of our situation. In other words, ruins that really intervene into the present as a repetition. The question we must address now is, how to unblock the cycle of protest and renormalization of this repetition of normalization? That is to say, how do we do it from within the spectacularized aesthetic of the ultra-normalized unpresent? Let me conclude with a few thoughts and maybe some con concrete practical suggestions as well. First, regarding public monuments. Instead of returning to a model of permanently memorializing an illusory and grand eloquent past, arts councils and policymakers should and could consider commissioning temporary commemorative works rooted in local community histories and local struggles that would reflect the multifaceted history of the nations that they are founded. In any case, the task of representing a nation's complicated past should not fall only to the inventiveness of artists. It should belong to all those who are engaged, all those who are residents, all those who are documented or not, everyone with a stake in reimagining the way history is presented in public space. Second, what are we gonna make of the current wave of public resistance, artistic and otherwise. The recent wave of activist art is perhaps the only form of critical cultural resistance possible in which everything familiar about art, as has been studied, reproduced, coveted, collected, and curated, is peeled away today, revealing the condition of what I call bare art, 
a state in which the once concealed social, political, and economic contradictions of high culture are fully undisclosed and in plain sight. Put differently, we cannot help but see the unveiled truth that cultural and cultural objects are forms of social relations generated by actual art workers and not by some mysterious autonomous artistic exceptionalism so often used to prop up contemporary art hierarchies in its discourse. This condition of bare art also shows art to be fully entwined with the commodification and marketing of high culture. Thus, this paradigm shift we witness today includes explosive bursts of monumentocide, temporary occupations of urban spaces, strident forms of oppositional pageantry and artistic activism. These spectacular public events, whether highly organized or spontaneous, formal or informal, tactical or strategic, these are the oppositional weapons of the weak and the oppressed. They operate as a direct critical response to suppression by the state, by corporate capitalism, and by white supremacist ideology. We need to begin to see this activism as constituting a rich, if jagged and incomplete, counter narrative, and to see and appreciate it as a vast surplus archive of creative dark matter, whose reoccurring agency is always already an uneasy constituent of ongoing capitalist crisis. Recognizing this eruption as a fragmented but powerful history from below is the first step towards answering the question I posed earlier. How do we unblock our image of the future, even as we struggle within an ultra-normalized and crisis-driven present? That said, our goal must be more than just the demolition of offensive public monuments and other icons of injustice. No future, no past. It is the uncanny condition of the unpresent. It's this that we must demolish in order to demonstrate that our mere survival is not enough and prove once and for all that collective resistance is never futile. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah Hoke and Sosmek McDonough for inviting me in the first place. Have a wonderful conference.